Now the problem is, um, this is the image of the Arctic, and Arctics love this cartoon um, in the sort of way that the Irish love Irish jokes, almost, you know. And what it talks about, of course, is multiple personality of an Arctic. And, of course, while you could say this is a negative light, we're actually quite interested, as we think about the city, how this multiple personality disorder we have um, might actually be useful and can help all of us make a better city. The, the, idea of the, architect, oh, back one. the idea of the architect actually has a long history, and going back to Plato around about 300 uh, BC, uh, you know, Plato loved the idea of the metaphor of the architect. You know, the metaphor itself is the, the definition of someone who's there to organise the environment around us, to organise the cosmos. Uh, and, Pla and Plato was into this, you know, and we all have this kind of, you know, urge, I think, as people to sort of have an organised understanding of the way we are in the world. So you see things like the celestial images and the standing stones, these are sort of very early attempts to sort of do that. Uh, the, the problem was, of course, Plato hated the actual architect. Because when we have this sort of despised um, sort of reality that we have to negotiate with every day. So while Plato's rational moment was you know, all about his beautiful garden, Jeremy Till gives a great quote when he says, um, you know, architects were banished from Plato's rational garden and condemned to build the wall around it forevermore. And we've been struggling to get back into that bloody garden ever since. So there's, a sort of, there's this sort of neurosis which is embedded in architecture, this kind of sort of rational, irrational sort of side to us. Um, this is the architect that we're all supposed to be, of course, and you know, this is Howard Rourke, mid-century, um, standing there. How do you match up to that? I mean, <laughs> I'm only five and a half feet, I can't, <laughs> I can't get anywhere near that. Yeah. <laughs> so Howard Rourke, with his autonomous building, sitting there in the city as a sort of like, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it is the, the product of modernism, the product of individuality, the product of rational order in the world. Um, the thing about that is that that's not how the world works, and we were sort of convinced that that was how the world works for a long time, and I particularly blame, blame the Bauhaus for this, and Plato, who I think actually is a bit of a jerk for doing this to us. <laughs> so, you know, where we got to though, this is sort of actually the way the world actually works. This is sort of a quick slide just to sort of show you that, you know, the world that we've discovered through network theory and these types of uh, things in the last sort of 30 years, really the sweet spot for us is right in the middle. There's a sort of highly regular networks on the one hand, and chaotic networks on the other hand, but what network theorists have found out, actually a little bit of dirt, a little bit of chaos, a little bit of sort of um, uh, disorder actually makes the world go better. We need that disorder, we need that dynamism to make the world sort of generate. So I'll explain how it all went a bit wrong um, with architects because um, Le Corbusier, one of the most famous architects of the last century, said of course, you know, architecture is the masterly, correct, magnificent play of masses brought together in light. Very platonic idea, platonic solids, you know, cylinders and cones and spheres and things like that, rendered beautifully in light. And he did some lovely projects, did this house, there he is, looking very serious on the left, he did this house on the right, which is a classic platonic project. It's like the whole universe crammed into that building. It's a building for measuring the universe. It's so important, the garden, of course, even sits around it so the building can be understood as the centre of the universe. <laughs> now, this is all fine until he um, upscaled. So, <laughs> what happened then is... Um, you may or may not guess that city, but the island in the bottom right is a bit of a, a hint for the Francophiles in the audience. And so, of course, the idea was that as you could control a single house, you could also control a whole city. And it was actually very well intended. It was all about health and social equity and, um, you know, being outside and fresh air and all that sort of thing. But, of course, the problem was this single idea had been upscaled. Now, the problem we've got as architects is we've been dealing with that ever since, and you haven't forgiven us for it. Um, <laughs> so. And the thing is, you know, the doctor he did that house for, you think that doctor at that time was probably using leeches, all sorts of, you know, pills and potions you certainly won't get on your Medicare rebate uh, nowadays. Um, but the thing is, you know, doctors somehow advanced. You let them have ER and Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> we are still struggling with that image of that city. So this is a quick example about how you approach a city, I think, if you're not coming from the top down, if you're not that rationalist sort of image. There's a quick project I did with some students at Berkeley when I was there uh, before coming back to Sydney called Wi-Fi, and the task was really just to understand that the city is already there. If you actually go looking, what you find is that in San Francisco, for example, there's 400 manhole covers in any one block in downtown. So rather than actually having to sort of put more stuff in the city, we just said, well, why don't we just repurpose those manhole covers? Sure, they can still be manhole covers, but as a wayfinding device to find your way elegantly around the city, perhaps we should just combine them with a mobile phone and an RFID chip, and that'll be a sort of nice way to sort of tell you whether you're getting hotter or colder as you move towards your destination. So, you know, for us, architecture is not actually the masterly, correct, and magnificent play of masses brought together in light. Rather, architecture is a mongrel, not a thoroughbred. 
And that's kind of the big message I guess I want to really leave you with today. Gerard's <laughs> probably going to disagree with me I'll give in five minutes. Um, so architecture <laughs> is a mongrel. And it's this sort of idea of complexity that we actually want to embrace. We think actually designers have been trained, creatives all over the world in all sorts of domains and disciplines, have been told that creativity is something that you kind of buy at the MCA gift store. And we don't believe that. You know, it's too messy and it's too rich. And that diversity is what we have to sort of strive for. So we're going to talk about a communal creativity. And to start with a guy who's um, certainly influenced us a lot, Leon Van Skyke, who wrote this book called Spatial Intelligence. And this came out of um, Gardner's seven types of intelligence that in, are themselves, of course, contested. But the important thing about that list is, of course, linguistic and mathematical sit at the top, the stuff we all do to get through school and high school and into our jobs. But, of course, there are other types of intelligence. And spatial intelligence, um, we, he thinks, is, of course, very important because the mistake we all made is when everyone was sort of manning up in the 19th century to make professions. Um, and architects want to sit alongside doctors and lawyers. And it's like, what, what do we call our world? What's, what's our discipline? And the idea was, at that time, they um, encapsulated building. They said, OK, all the stuff around building, we'll make that the stuff that means you can call yourself an architect. And Leon's contention is that was a complete stuff-up. Because actually, what we did in that moment was gave away the one thing we do really well, which is spatial thinking. And so all of a sudden, architects are trapped into this paradigm of building rather than thinking about the complex spatial problems we have in our cities. Now, this is linked um, to a message from um, Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson, best TED talk ever. Uh, am I right? <laughs> Bastard. And, <laughs> and he gave his first talk in 2006 when it all went online, so we're only all destined to be second after this. But he made the comment that, um, you know, we're educated out of creativity. And our talk is, in a way, um, raising a more specific version of that idea, is that we're all educated out of being free to use our spatial intelligence. So here's a quick example. This is actually my son, Alec, playing with one of those sort of corporate toys that you get after a conference uh, at the kitchen table last Saturday as I was sort of sitting there thinking about this talk. Um, actually, the miracle there was it was breakfast and I was actually thinking. So <laughs> that was a whole other thing. But the thing that I was noticing as Alec was moving this toy around in his hands was that there was this absolute sort of spatial fluidity with the way that he was moving. Uh, this toy, in a rapid succession, went from a, a car to a superstructure to a rocket launcher and, and a giraffe and all the rest. Uh, and as, as Alec moved it around, he just didn't stop to think about the consequences of these things. But the point was, he was just sort of exercising this spatial thinking, like, without thinking about it. Um, that's, I think, you know, the sort of thing we're talking about. We as adults, we get trained out of that. The, it's a really hard thing to do. Actually, when was the last time you really found yourself thinking about the world around you in those sorts of plastic terms? When did you sort of go outside, you know, out the front here, for example, and say to yourself, oh, yeah, I think actually I should move the door. This is a great space that I could actually do something in, like sort of have a trapeze artist. You know? And this is what kids do very, very naturally. The, the thing was, he was actually doing it under the table at the time, which sort of gave it a whole sort of degree of difficulty, which was about an eight and a half, I reckon. But it's a reminder there, which is really that um, uh, you know, the kids have this sort of natural capacity to see the world in this sort of com com completely fluid and spatial way, and we have become habitualised as adults into thinking the wrong way about our environment. Now, the best architects, um, we argue, they're for big kids. And one of the biggest kids of all was Jörn Utzen. Um, and he's sort of, his son Jan once told me that you know, when Jörn went back to Denmark, he got second all the time in competitions. <laughs> and um, that was very annoying, of course. And it was particularly annoying because the winners of the competitions would do so-called standard modernist boxes. And of course, Jörn Utzen was always looking for something more. And apparently in exasperation one day with a matchbox, he said, you know, it's easy for them, isn't it? That's a public building. That's an apartment block. That's a tower. <laughs> and the thing about that is that um, Damn those modernists. you can see his mind working in something like the Opera House, because it is many things at once. It's the, the scrum of nuns, the mating turtles, it's the icon for a city, but it's also the platform upon which we carry out the most important rituals um, we have in our city here. So coming back to children again, we did a project a couple of years ago. Um, I'm looking slightly delirious from the amount of sugar we had to feed that child. And <laughs> what happened was um, we did a project in Stockholm for a gallery, and your client was a six-year-old, a six-year-old girl. And um, it was a very serious project to understand how children think about space, and so it was run very formally as, as a proper commission project. And so we asked this girl, what would she like? And she was like, well, you know, I'd like a pink princess castle. And we thought, OK, we can deal with that. And so we made a pink princess castle. But that was also a bit disappointing, because like, already at six years old, she's trained into this certain paradigm of thinking. But then it got interesting. Then she said, yeah, when I live in this thing, and oh, my sister will be in it as well, and oh, our friend will come over, and they'll live in it, and we'll all be in our own rooms, and we'll go down these chutes and slides and meet in the bathroom. <laughs> now, 
That is awesome. You know, <laughs> the most disturbing thing about that is a six-year-old has such an obsession with plumbing. But the second thing, <laughs> the second thing um, is that, of course, what it shows is this amazing spatial mind. And so, for us, that was the best project we did that year. I mean, imagine you're in Sydney talking to your residential clients, more bedrooms, more bathrooms. Oh, I'm overcapitalising. Can you meet me at Surrey Hills on Saturday to choose bathroom tiles? Um, or you can hang out with kids and design the most amazing buildings. Option B. Um, so this is actually the city. This is the city that you probably recognise. It's the one that most of us live in. Um, but it's not that idea that Courbusier was pushing. You know, it's not the version of a rationality that we've been sort of trained to try and bring to design. Rather, it's a sort of complex and messy environment, and it requires a whole sort of spatial intelligence around it that we've sort of almost forgotten about. So if you actually think about it, all the issues that we're facing as a society today around our cities are things like transport, density, housing, cost of living, those types of things. They are all spatial in most of their sort of components. So this brings us back to Venice, because this image was taken by John Gollings, who was part of the last Venice Biennale of Architecture um, Australian Pavilion in 2010. And Peter Verwer gave a talk, um, head of the Property Council, um, you know, lead agent in the sort of $670 billion property industry. He gave a talk at the Press Club a couple of months ago. And it was quite interesting, because he of course made the perhaps obvious point that 80% of us live in cities. 80% of our productivity is from cities. Um, but then he went on to say, you know, the problem though is that what good is Fair Work Australia if you can't actually get to work in less than two hours? What, you know, what good is a new hospital if it's built in the wrong place? And then he started making this very interesting discussion, because of course he's not an architect, but he said, you know, in Canberra they talk about, of course, our prosperity. We need to sort of advance and increase our pros prosperity. And the, the jargon apparently for that is the three Ps. Population, getting more of us. Productivity, doing a lot of stuff. And participation, getting together so we can do all that stuff. And he said all those three Ps are spatial issues. So the lesson there is, why is it? that to make our cities, we drill through 230,000 pages of planning law. Why is it that us, planners, all the people making our cities rely again on all this stuff written down and often decided in separate places, in separate silos, without any really sophisticated spatial thinking um, tying it all together? So I guess the thing we sort of want to leave you with today is that, you know, we want you to embrace complexity. By doing this, it actually brings design from the hand of the, the sort of the master architect, from the grand design, if I could say that, um, down to something which involves us all. Uh, and we also want you to embrace your spatial thinking. We want you to go out there and actually try and exercise that muscle in your brain, that intelligence that you've probably forgotten about a little bit. Try and get that going again. And I think I can all meet you down at Belmore Park next Sunday for a bit of sort of you know, spatial calisthenics. Um, so that's, a sort of, that's where we want to sort of leave it, I guess. But so we'll see you in Venice. Every Australian who comes to Venice um, will get a little red light. And they'll make these very interesting formations as they walk around the city. And what we're doing in Venice is foregrounding not architects and their buildings, but architects who work with other people, with doctors, with environmental planners, with welders, with a range of other people, to actually do things that actually affect the city in very, very large ways beyond the individual building. So if you can handle two days with a bunch of sweaty architects, see you soon. Thanks. Thank you.